Anatomy of the State by Murray N. Rothbard Narrated by Harold Fritchie How the State Preserves Itself The union of church and state was one of the oldest and most successful of these ideological devices. The ruler was either anointed by God, or in the case of absolute rule of many oriental despotisms, was himself God. Hence, any resistance to his rule would be blasphemy. The state's priestcraft performed the basic intellectual function of obtaining popular support and even worship for the rulers. Another successful device was to instill fear of any alternative system of rule or non-rule. The present rulers, it was maintained, supply to the citizens an essential service for which they should be most grateful, protection against sporadic criminals and marauders. For the state, to preserve its own monopoly of predation, did indeed see to it that private and unsystematic crime was kept to a minimum. The state has always been jealous of its own preserve. Especially has the state been successful in recent centuries in instilling fear of other state rulers. Since the land area of the globe has been parceled out among particular states, one of the basic doctrines of the state was to identify itself with the territory it governed. Since most men tend to love their homeland, the identification of that land and its people with the state was a means of making natural patriotism work to the state's advantage. If Ruritania was being attacked by Waldavia, the first task of the state and its intellectuals was to convince the people of Ruritania that the attack was really upon them and not simply upon the ruling caste. In this way, a war between rulers was converted into a war between peoples, with each people coming to the defense of its rulers in the erroneous belief that the rulers were defending them. This device of nationalism has only been successful in Western civilization in recent centuries. It was not too long ago that the mass of subjects regarded wars as irrelevant battles between various sets of nobles. Many and subtle are the ideological weapons that the state has wielded through the centuries. One excellent weapon has been tradition. The longer that the rule of a state has been able to preserve itself, the more powerful this weapon. For then, the X dynasty or the Y state has the seeming weight of centuries of tradition behind it. Worship of one's ancestors, then, becomes a none too subtle means of worship of one's ancient rulers. The greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism. There is no better way to stifle that criticism than to attack any isolated voice, any raisers of new doubts, as a profane violator of the wisdom of his ancestors. Another potent ideological force is to deprecate the individual and exalt the collectivity of society. For since any given rule implies majority acceptance, any ideological danger to that rule can only start from one or a few independently thinking individuals. The new idea, much less the new critical idea, must needs begin as a small minority opinion. Therefore, the state must nip the view in the bud by ridiculing any view that defies the opinions of the mass. Listen only to your brothers, or adjust to society, thus becomes ideological weapons for crushing individual dissent. By such measures, the masses will never learn of the non-existence of their emperor's clothes. H. L. Mencken wrote in 1949, All government can see in an original idea is potential change, and hence an invasion of its prerogatives. The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. Almost inevitably he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane, and intolerable, and so, if he is romantic, he tries to change it. And even if he is not romantic personally, he is very apt to spread discontent among those who are. It is also important for the state to make its rule seem inevitable. Even if its reign is disliked, it will then be met with passive resignation, as witnessed the familiar coupling of death and taxes. One method is to induce historiographical determinism as opposed to individual freedom of will. 
If the X dynasty rules us, this is because the inexorable laws of history, or the divine will, or the absolute, or the material productive forces have so decreed, and nothing any puny individuals may do can change this inevitable decree. It is also important for the state to inculcate in its subjects an aversion to any conspiracy theory of history. For a search for conspiracies means a search for motives and an attribution of responsibility for historical misdeeds. If, however, any tyranny imposed by the state or venality or aggressive war was caused not by the state rulers but by mysterious and arcane social forces or by the imperfect state of the world or if in some way everyone was responsible, then there is no point in the people becoming indignant or rising up against such misdeeds. Furthermore, an attack on conspiracy theories means that the subjects will become more gullible in believing the general welfare reasons that are always put forth by the state for engaging in any of its despotic actions. A conspiracy theory can unsettle the system by causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. Another tried-and-true method for bending subjects to the state's will is inducing guilt. Any increase in private well-being can be attacked as unconscionable greed, materialism, or excessive affluence. Profit-making can be attacked as exploitation and usury. Mutually beneficial exchanges denounced as selfishness and somehow with the conclusion always being drawn that more resources should be siphoned from the private to the public sector. The induced guilt makes the public more ready to do just that. For while individual persons tend to indulge in selfish greed, the failure of the state's rulers to engage in exchanges is supposed to signify their devotion to higher and nobler causes, parasitic predations being apparently morally and aesthetically lofty as compared to peaceful and productive work. In the present more secular age, the divine right of the state has been supplemented by the invocation of a new god, science. State rule is now proclaimed as being ultra-scientific, as constituting planning by experts. But while reason is invoked more than in previous centuries, this is not the true reason of the individual and his exercise of free will. It is still collectivist and determinist, still implying holistic aggregates and coercive manipulation of passive subjects by their rulers. The increasing use of scientific jargon has permitted the state's intellectuals to weave obscurantist apologia for state rule that would only have met with derision by the populace of a simpler age. A robber who justified his theft by saying that he really helped his victims by his spending giving a boost to retail trade would find few converts, but when this theory is clothed in Keynesian equations and impressive references to the multiplier effect, it unfortunately carries more conviction. And so the assault on common sense proceeds, each age performing the task in its own way. Thus, ideological support being vital to the state, it must unceasingly try to impress the public with its legitimacy, to distinguish its activities from those of mere brigands. The unremitting determination of its assaults on common sense is no accident, for as men can vividly maintain, the average man, whatever his errors otherwise, at least sees clearly that government is something lying outside him and outside the generality of his fellow men, that it is a separate, independent, and hostile power only partly under his control and capable of doing him great harm. Is it a fact of no significance that robbing the government is everywhere regarded as a crime of less magnitude than robbing an individual or even a corporation? What lies behind all this, I believe, is a deep sense of the fundamental antagonism between the government and the people it governs. It is apprehended, not as a committee of citizens chosen to carry on the communal business of the whole population, but as a separate and autonomous corporation mainly devoted to exploiting the population for the benefit of its own members. When a private citizen is robbed, a worthy man is deprived of the fruits of his industry and thrift. When the government is robbed, the worst that happens is that certain rogues and loafers have less money to play with than they had before. 
The notion that they have earned that money is never entertained. To most sensible men, it would seem ludicrous. Mm -hmm.